Well, it looks like we have uh, saved the best for last with, uh, with an excellent uh, healthcare panel that's going to cover uh, a number of issues. Um, my name is Benjamin Dominich. I am managing editor of Healthcare News and a research fellow for Heartland. Uh, and uh, I have some, some excellent colleagues who are going to be speaking uh, about uh, uh, the issues of, of Medicaid and entitlement reform. Uh, I'm going to address uh, the rather controversial subject which is going on at the state level um, today across the country when it comes to exchanges. Uh, but first I wanted to thank uh, everybody who's come before. I think this was an, a series of excellent presentations on a number of fronts. I particularly want to thank uh, Dave Bowes for his uh, excellent remarks. It's, it's always good to see folks from, from Cato joining in uh, and, and uh, talking about this at the state level, and, and I hope they can continue to, to do so. I, I do want to share a little bit of a, a joke, though, at, at perhaps at Cato's expense. I was in a, um, uh, a meeting recently with uh, Arthur Brooks, the president at um, the American Enterprise Institute, and he was talking about his, uh, his next book, which is called uh, The Road to Freedom, which is going to be making the moral case for, uh, for free enterprise and presenting it, I think, in a, in a really excellent way. But he talked about internal debates that he was he would have over the years with, with Ed Crane from, from Cato and this back and forth that they would always have via, via email. And he talked about one time they were having an argument and, and Arthur dug out this old quote from, from Hayek to, to throw back to Ed and just sort of said, well, see, you know, he agreed with me. And, and Ed's response to him was, well, you know, Fritz, he was always kind of a squish. <laughs> So uh, I appreciate Cato coming out and joining us today. I, um, I am joined today by uh, Ovik Roy, uh, who is here from New York. He blogs at what I think is, is maybe the best health policy blog that's online today. It's called The Apothecary. It's hosted by Forbes now, and I encourage you all to check it out. He is uh, an equity research analyst at Maness, uh Crespi Hart & Company and has previously uh, held a number of positions within the financial industry uh, and writes on healthcare policy for a number of places, including National Review, National Affairs. I'm sure that you've seen his work. Uh, and I'm also joined by uh, Rich Dolinar, who is a endocrinologist. Uh, he is uh, here from, from sunny Arizona, and he is, uh, as we say, on the ground where, where the actual action is, meeting with patients and uh, seeing the effects of encroaching government regulation at the ground level. Uh, so I think that both of them will be able to provide some, some excellent insight on their, on their subject matter. Uh, but I am going to talk a little bit here about exchanges, and um, uh, it's something that I think is, uh, is difficult to sort of hash out because there are a number of states out there that have different opinions about how they should act. They're fearful, essentially, about whether they ought to build an exchange themselves uh, implement it themselves, uh, or run the risk of having the federal government implement one for them. And uh, I want to explain a couple of reasons why I think that that's not actually an accurate picture of, of the risks that they face. Um, just to get you up to speed, at, at this point, uh, roughly 15 states uh, have made the decision to proceed with implementing an exchange. Uh, an exchange is, uh, according to Obamacare's framework, uh, a place where people are, are a marketplace that is, that is uh, designed along the lines of what you have uh, in Massachusetts and what exists in, essentially in its infancy uh, in Utah, uh, where people would make decisions within, uh, within a, a government-controlled, government-run marketplace. Um, about 15 states, as I said, have, have decided to proceed with this. Um, about 13 states have either rejected it outright, uh, vetoed a bill, uh, had the governor threaten to veto any bill that comes to their desk, uh, or even taken the, the rather extreme step of sending money back to Washington, which we rarely see, but I always like when that happens. Um, so there's those states on either end, and in the middle, there's a huge number of states that haven't actually taken firm action one way or the other. Most of them are studying the issue. Uh, they have various working groups. Uh, I actually spoke uh, just the other day in Indianapolis in front of one of those working groups um, and uh, joined by a number of other uh, stakeholders and, and interested parties. Uh, and uh, I shared a number of the reasons that I want to share with you today uh, why 
I am making the case across the country, and, and Heartland is as well, uh, that states should at the very least delay implementation of the exchanges uh, and at most send the, send the money back if they actually have the willpower to do so. Um, the first reason is that uh, Obamacare is in significant legal doubt. Uh, the crux of the law, the individual mandate, as you know, uh, is currently pending before the Supreme Court uh, thanks to a lawsuit that's been brought by 28 states. Uh, and as, as uh, current polling indicates, if you average it out, uh, the law is only supported by about 38 percent of the American people, and 80 percent of the American people oppose the individual mandate. Frankly, from my perspective, regardless of what the court does, and I'm not going to get into prognostications about how Anthony Kennedy is going to feel when he wakes up the morning that he has to decide, uh, but whatever the court rules, the impetus is there for major political changes to be made to this law. The legislation is going to be reopened within the next Congress, in my opinion, either by Democrats who are seeking to correct its many flaws uh, or by Republicans who are seeking to undo the whole thing and replace it with something that's new. The second reason is that the creation of a uh, federal exchange, from my perspective, is a hollow threat to the states. There are a number of critical problems with having a federally run HHS implemented exchange. Um, for one, there's no funding authorized in the law for such an exchange. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that HHS did not expect a significant number of states to go this route. And as the number grows, uh, and frankly, I think with more than 10 states, it would have to grow significantly, uh, HHS would actually have to go back to Congress to find uh, authorized funding for this amount. They just, they don't have enough budget to find it within there. Um, additionally, due to a drafting error, uh, section, section 1401 of the bill provides only for subsidies uh, through an exchange established by the state under section 1311. That doesn't include federally established exchanges. And this mistake essentially means that the law doesn't authorize access to those subsidies, which is the chief reasons that individuals would, would find the exchange appealing under any theoretical federal exchange. Fixing problems like this, again, would require reopening the bill, uh, cracking that thing open and, and having another debate again. Third reason to wait, states would have very little control. Uh, even those people who supported and advocated for an exchange in Massachusetts and Utah have turned against the idea now that the rules have come out from HHS about what these things would actually look like. And those rules, just so you know, are still in the very vague initial stages. They are not even to the point where people can have a clear idea of what these exchanges look like. Uh, but just to give you an example from one, the, the Heritage, Heritage Foundations uh, at Hazelmeyer, who I have debated about exchanges with in the past, uh, wrote after the initial regulations were released that a state would now have no more real control over an exchange it set up than over one HHS established. As the details come into focus about these exchanges, it just appears that they function as delivery mechanisms for bureaucracy. Uh, it's, it's all about bureaucratic regulation and costly subsidies. It's not actually about opening up a marketplace. The state level exchange from my perspective is actually just about letterhead. Um, Louisiana's Health Secretary, Bruce Greenstein, had a great uh, and very honest uh, quote about this when he opted against implementation. He said, if we were to run it, it would have the governor's name on top of the letterhead for every letter that goes out to every business and every family announcing every increase in premiums. Now whenever I explain this at the state level, inevitably the, the legislators, the elected officials in the room, they all start to murmur <laughs> and because they understand what that means as a political matter. Uh, number four, the exchanges themselves are in significant flux. Uh, Richard Burkhauser, who's a professor at Cornell, recently discovered that the exchange subsidy costs uh, were calculated based only on the affordability of individual coverage, not on family plans. Uh, now, this is a complicated issue, but to break it down, this essentially means that families aren't eligible for subsidies as long as the breadwinner's plan is calculated as being affordable. This is a huge problem, and it hurts you either way. If the law really does mean single coverage, then you're going to have millions of people who aren't going to get the coverage that they were expecting under it. If the opposite is true, then the exchanges are likely to cost as much as $50 billion more each year to taxpayers beyond initial estimates. Employees may end up in this bizarre situation where they're, they're essentially begging their employers to make their coverage unaffordable so their families can gain access to thousands of dollars in taxpayer-funded subsidies in the exchanges. 
Either way, again, Congress is likely to be forced to address this issue by reopening the law. And that's, of course, complicated by the unique historical way that the law was passed. Uh, number five, time is running out for the states. Implementing an exchange is likely to be delayed even for those states where everybody's all on board with the idea. They've all agreed to it. Just considering the sheer amount of tasks that are still left for the states to decide, including running a reinsurance and risk management, uh, risk adjustment program, uh, funding and monitoring the navigators who are supposed to help citizens understand the exchange, uh, defining and monitoring network adequacy, anti-discrimination provisions, uh, forming plans on how you're going to fund the exchange starting in 2015. That last one's a big one. And just to give you a perspective on uh, how states are currently deciding to do it, uh, Oregon decided to choose a premium tax of 5%. So, and that's of course on top of the increasing cost of premiums across the country. Uh, and that's all just the stuff that they have to do at the state level. That doesn't involve in any way Washington approving any of these steps. Uh, you have to report every single one of these to DC. You have to get the necessary approvals from HHS. And given how delayed the process has been there on them coming up with their own rules, uh, the lengthy amount of time that it's taken, I'm just not sure, and there are a lot of industry people who are now coming to believe that even if you wanted to launch an exchange, you're not gonna get it done under the wire. Frankly, I think that states, legislators, et cetera, should expect change. They should expect Congress to reopen this bill. They should, they should expect uh, the political motivation to be there to revisit it. Uh, those are all pragmatic reasons I've laid out for why states should avoid implementation. Uh, but there's another element of this as well. Um, at the end of the day, if you find that you've spent the taxpayer's dime to implement a law that no longer exists, or is significantly reformed, voters are likely to respond to that. And that's because there's a moral issue here. As a matter of principle, you swear an oath to defend the Constitution of your state and the Constitution of the United States. And if you find that you have implemented a law which may very shortly be ruled unconstitutional, you're going to have to answer for that. You're also going to have to answer for spending a dollar which is earned by the labor of another in that effort. Uh, Calvin Coolidge, who's one of my favorite presidents, said that I've noticed that nothing I've never said has hurt me, and I advocate that the states should find that an Obamacare exchange that they've never built will never hurt them either. And with that, I want to uh, turn to my colleagues. Ovik, if you'd like to uh, either come up or there, that's fine. Either way, whatever you prefer. Thank you.